Hi everyone, let's talk about this idea of cutoff in a rectangular waveguide. Now, before we, we get right into that, it's important to take a step back and remember that we had this dispersion relation that was imposed by the Helmholtz equation, where we had k0 squared was equal to kx squared plus k sub y squared plus k sub z squared. So you notice this represents a kind of uh, Pythagorean theorem relationship in three dimensions, where you have some wave, wave vector pointing in some particular direction, and we break it down into its x, y, and z contributions. And then, of course, the magnitude squared would be the sum of all the other squares. So we talked a little bit about that idea in class, and this relation just has to always be imposed uh, by virtue of the Helmholtz equation. So this k sub 0 squared, squared has a name. We call that the intrinsic wave number, and it satisfies omega over c. So this thing here is a function of my velocity of propagation, my speed of light, and uh, the, the frequency of excitation, omega. So that's an angular frequency. We also found that when we imposed boundaries on the rectangular waveguide, this guy here became a m pi over a. So just remember for reference, if I were to draw a quick waveguide over here. So here's my waveguide, like so. Oops, sorry. From here to here, that would be a, and then this would be zero to b. So our a direction, our, our, our a length, our x length is assumed to be greater than our y length. So this x component to my wave vector, my wave number, uh, had to satisfy this condition. And then likewise for my y contribution, we showed that it had to be this n, sorry, squared, n pi over b for the y value here. And then this was the longitudinal propagation constant, which we simply just gave the special character, you know, beta sub n comma n, because it could change depending on m and n. And of course, we'll square that here. Okay, so just in your mind, this is a little bit more in the abstract sense, but it's common to use these, uh, these symbols a little more interchangeably. It's just that when we're in waveguides and we have this mode relationship, it's a little more common to think about it in these other sort of uh, symbolic terms. So the idea now was let's solve for the longitudinal propagation constant. So that's the, the propagation constant down the waveguide. And we found we would, we would get something like the following. So you get k naught squared minus m pi over a squared minus n pi over b squared. And then you would take the square root of all of that. Okay, so this should look pretty familiar. We did all this with the parallel plate waveguide. When we added the extra dimension on the rectangular waveguide, we just got this extra mode number uh, between m and n. Now, it's also important to remember that technically this has both a positive and a negative solution to it. So what does that mean? Well, remember our Z dependence in our, our field profiles, we assumed took on the form of this E to the J beta Z. So if I pick out the positive root of this expression, what that would represent is a wave propagating down the positive z direction in the waveguide. However, hypothetically, there's no reason why I should single out the positive values. If I pluck out the negative values here, so let's maybe hypothetically, if I put a negative, you'll notice that would make this a positive here. And all that would represent is a wave propagating down in the opposite direction. So they're both equally valid solutions. Just for convenience, we've been uh, focusing on the positive solution here rather than the negative. But you could hypothetically excite a waveguide from both ends and you would just have those solutions uh, superimposing each other <laughs> and just propagating right through each other in opposite directions. So it's important to kind of bear that in mind that there's this, both of these positive and negative solutions are perfectly viable because they will both satisfy this relationship. So you look at this, however, and the same argument applies. What happens if my mode numbers keep going higher and higher such that eventually they exceed this value here, well then you'll notice you'll get a square root of a negative number. So we'll call this the, the cutoff condition, or I would say m pi over a squared plus 
n pi over b squared is greater than or equal to k naught squared. So when when they're equal, obviously this whole thing goes to zero and you get no pro uh, propagation down z. And when they're greater, then you get this uh, square root of a negative number effect. So let's explore that a little bit. When they're greater than this propagation constant, I get the square root of a negative number. And so my beta sub nm turns into something that kind of looks like the following. I'll have a j alpha nm like that. So it becomes purely imaginary in the event that I exceed this inequality here, or that I satisfy this inequality, these two terms being greater than here. So what that means for my longitudinal propagation is I again will see something like e to the minus j. Uh, instead of beta, I'm gonna put j alpha and m z like that. So my beta becomes this imaginary thing here. And it's also important to remember this has a positive and a negative value for the same reason that this is the square root of a thing. So positive and negative components are both equally viable. So if I plug in this imaginary thing, you'll notice I get e to the plus alpha n m z. So that will represent exponential growth for a way of propagating down z or exponential decay if it's going in the opposite direction, say. But again, there's no reason to prefer the positive solution over the negative. They're both equally valid. So I could also just get e to the minus alpha n m z, and that would be an equally viable solution. So this would represent a decay in the positive z direction. So in that sense, we'll just kind of draw these e to the minus j beta n m z. We tend to prefer the so uh, it's a, you can say the, the negative solution here corresponds to the positive up here in the sense that I want my waves to decay in the positive z direction in accordance with wave, the real prop power propagating in that z direction uh, because otherwise you don't violate, you, you get infinite energy in the system, right? <clears throat> um, so that just sort of remember, in the back of your head. I have a plus or minus here and a plus or minus here. A positive here represents positive propagation in the plus z direction. A negative here will represent decay in the z direction. And we like this one because it will represent a sort of conservation of energy rather than an explosion of energy. So again, they are both perfectly valid solutions to the Helmholtz equation. We just reject one of them uh, depending on whether or not we wish to conserve energy. So this is, of course, our usual cutoff condition here. And these waves are the same evanescent modes, just like we learned before. So it's evanescent. I think it's S-E-N-T. <laughs> That's either an E or an A. So those are the evanescent modes, or you can call them the cutoff modes because of this exponential decay. So again, this, this field, just like we learned before, it will carry no real power. It will have it will store energy in it in a sort of reactive sense, but it will not carry it will not propagate any real energy. So what we want to do is calculate the cutoff frequency for a given mode. So we're just going to substitute over here omega over c squared instead of k naught, and I'm going to put a little m n there to indicate that each mode is going to have its own cutoff frequency with it. So what you'll get, of course, is omega sub n m over c squared is equal to m pi over a squared plus n pi over b squared. So let's just solve for that omega sub n uh, sub n m. You get omega n m. So this will be the cutoff frequency for the n comma nth mode. <laughs> it's a bit of a mouthful. And you rearrange your terms here. So you take the square root of that and you multiply the speed of light here. And again, whether you want to say C or C naught doesn't matter. I tend to prefer C naught to indicate the speed of light in a vacuum. But if this were filled with some sort of dielectric, then it's, it's common to take away that little zero and just put C to indicate the speed of light in that particular material. So as a general rule, C and C sub zero will be interchangeable for most of the time, but there, there is kind of an implied distinction uh, but we won't get into that with this class. Then you'll get the square root of m pi over a squared plus 
n pi over b squared. So the long story short is this is called the, oops, the cutoff frequency. The cutoff frequency for the n -mph mode. So every one of these modes inside of that waveguide will have a corresponding cutoff frequency associated with it, meaning no frequencies below this value will be able to carry real power. Instead, they will have this evanescent uh, decay associated with them. And of course, for what it's worth, just remember that omega is equal to 2 pi f. So if I want to calculate uh, this in terms of hertz rather than radians per second, you would just uh, divide by 2 pi over here. So I'm just going to put a little f. My cutoff frequency in terms of hertz will be the same thing over here. They'll just be a 1 over 2 pi kind of taped onto the front here, like so. <clears throat> okay, so, but all of those same ideas apply that we learned before. So we don't have to focus too much on any of the derivations. It's just this is the, the cutoff frequency for the NM mode in a rectangular waveguide. And you see it shares a lot of the same properties that we learned with the regular parallel plate waveguide, just with the addition of this extra mode number here corresponding to the, the other dimensions on that plate. But that's essentially rectangular waveguide cutoff in a nutshell.